Well, welcome back. We are now doing section 5.4, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, uh, preset videos. And um, this particular section is going to be focusing on the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, what, what the, our textbook, Dr. Short's textbook is, part one. Now, you're very familiar with one concept of Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, and that was that integral from A to B of f of x dx. When you integrate with bounds, you get the antiderivative, big F of x, evaluated from A to B, and this idea of plug in top into your antiderivative minus plug in bottom into the antiderivative, and that gives you that area under the curve. That's what uh, Dr. Stewart calls Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2. We are actually focusing on the other Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, the Part 1 version. And that is still dealing with the integrals, but here's the deal. If f is a continuous function on the interval between a and b, and g of x is the integral from a to x of some function f of t dt. So remember, g of x is the integral from some starting point a to the arbitrary x of a different function f of t dt, where a is less than x, which is less than or equal to b, and then g prime of x will be equal to f of x. Now that's a big notation, and what does this, all this really mean? Well, it really means is this. When you take the derivative of an integral, an integral is an antiderivative. So the, inter so the derivative of an antiderivative, they cancel each other out, and you get back to where you started from. So if I took the derivative of this g function, which is the derivative of an integral, that cancels, and you would just be left with the original f of x function back again. In the Leibniz notation here, the derivative d dx of the integral from a to x of f of t dt, the derivative and the integral cancel. You would just have this f of t, just replace t with x because that's what you're taking the derivative with respect to that variable x. So the derivative integral cancel and you just get the function that's inside all the parentheses. That's what's going on. But of course there's a little more, there's more calculus involved in this. So with this, you have to work on the uh, variations of the rules. This is the first one, the derivative of the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Notice the x variable is on the top bound and a is some constant on the bottom bound of your integrand. So the derivative of this guy would just be f of x. But if you happen to switch the bounds, remember from our properties of uh, integrals here, when you switch the bounds, you have to make it negative. So when the variable is on the bottom, it's negative. When the variable is on top, it'll be positive, but it'll be the same thing. The derivative of the integral from a to a function, other than something other than x of f of t dt, would be equal to f of g of that uh, x times g prime of x. Now what this really is, is the chain rule. Well, the derivative of an integral cancels. So you just get to plug in the function in terms of t. But because you are taking the derivative, remember the chain rule, the derivative of the outside, inside stays the same, so there's my outside, the inside stays the same, but then you have to do times the derivative of the inside. So this is the chain rule version where you take the derivative of an integral from a to a function of f of t dt, with the derivative integral cancels, so you do f of that function, but then times the derivative of what you plugged in. And if you had functions on the top and the bottom, you, the derivative integral cancels, so you just plug in g into f times your the inside, minus plug in h n for t in the f function times your the inside. So chain rule minus chain rule type deal. So let's take a look at some examples here. Again, this is what chapter 5.4 is all about. So notice this problem f of x is the integral from 14 to x of 5e to the 3t squared plus 10 dt. We want to figure out what f prime of x is. f prime of x is the derivative of the integral from 14 to x of this 5e to the 3t squared plus 10 dt. But when I take a derivative of an integral, they end up canceling. So what I'm going to be left with is this f prime of x would be 5e to the 3x squared plus 10. Now notice something or other. Did I actually do calculus? Well, yes, in a way I did. I took the derivative of an integral. That ended up canceling. 
That's my calculus there. But all I really did, since the variable x was on top, when it's on top, all I'm going to do is get the original function back in. Derivative integral cancels. There's my answer right there. And all I did was replace uh, x, uh, x, replace the t with the x to get my answer. That's what this fundamental theorem of calculus is telling us. You really don't have to do any calculus when you take derivative of an integral. They'll end up canceling because they're opposite for one another. So let's try this problem. f of x is equal to the integral from x to 102 of the sine of e to the 2t plus 17 dt. We want to figure out what the derivative is. Well, the one thing I notice about this problem versus the first problem, the first problem, the x was on the top. And so when I take my derivative, the integral cancels, and I just plug in x on the top. And it really goes back to that first fundamental theorem of calculus about plug in top minus plug in bottom, that, that other fundamental theorem of calculus. But the bottom is a constant, and the derivative of constant is 0. So the derivative of a constant being 0, well, that, the constant, I don't care what it is, whether it's 14 or 102, is never going to play a part in the problem because the derivative of that eventually is going to be 0. But because the variable is in the bottom, this answer is going to be negative, big bracket here, the sine of e to the 2x plus 17, close bracket. The, when I'm taking the derivative of an integral, the derivative of the integral cancel, but because the x is on the bottom, it's got to be a minus, and all I did was just recopy my function and put x wherever the t's were located at. Officially, this is an angle, so two parentheses there. Well, let's take a look at question number three then. This one's a little bit different in that, okay, f of x is the integral from 98, who cares, to 4x cubed. The variable function is in the top, that's what I'm focused on here, a 5 natural log of t cubed plus 15 dt. And you're supposed to take derivative of this guy. Well, the derivative of an integral cancels, so this is an integral function. So when I take derivative of it, that will cancel. So there's my answer right there. But in place of t, I'm going to plug in 4x cubed. Now, this is not just an x like the last two problems. This is a function. So i got to use the chain rule version of it. So this, the answer is going to be 5 natural log of 4x cubed cubed. I'm replacing the t with 4x cubed, and we're cubing it, plus 15, close parentheses. So there's my function right there, but because it's the chain rule, I want to show you this, times the derivative of the inside. What we put on the inside was the 4x cubed, and the derivative of that, back to calculus 1, is 12x squared. Now, of course, you could, if you wanted to, clean this up to figure out which multiple choice answer it's going to be. So this would be 5 times the natural log of, well, let's see here, 4 cubed. That's 4 times 4 times 4. I believe that's 64, but we'll check that out on the old calculator just to make sure I don't screw it up too bad. Yep, that's 64. x cubed cubed, power to a power I multiply, that'll be x to the ninth. Okay, plus 15. But remember, all that being multiplied by 12x squared. Now you can multiply your coefficients together. And uh, 12 times 5 is 60. So this answer for terms of uh, checking it with the multiple choice part would be 60x squared. I just put that out front. Times the natural log of 64x to the ninth plus 15. And there would be my solution. But honestly, on web work or on our, even on our test and stuff, this is the stuff that we're looking for. We want to see that you understand the concept of the derivative and integral cancel. So you end up getting the function that you started with, and then you're plugging in what the function is. And if it's a function, you plug it in, and then you're going to do chain rule times the derivative inside. So let's do one more of these. Well, the last kind of problem is this. It's another question. It's about average value. Now, the average value is really asking you guys, you've got this function on the interval between 1 and 12. On average, what is the y-coordinate? Now, I will let you know where this function comes from, where this formula comes from. If you're calculating the average value, how do you calculate an average? You sum up the functional values and divide by the number of points that you had. We'll call it n. 
But if you remember from your Riemann sum stuff, delta x is equal to b minus a over n. And if I solve this for n, n would be equal to b minus a over delta x. And if I replace this, this would give me the sum of f over b minus a over delta x. And if I clean this up, when you divide by a fraction, you invert and multiply. So that's going to give you 1 over b minus a. I'm going to flip that out front. The sum of f, we'll call him f of x, times delta x. I just, when you flip it up, the delta x goes in the back. I just called him f of x because that's really what he is there. And I put the 1 over b as a constant out front, but it would be on the bottom. This generates the formula. Now, if you look at this and remind you how to go from Riemann sums to integrals, the formula that you need to have memorized for average value is 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. When you're finding the average value of some function f of x over the interval between a and b, this is your formula. So, and again, your professor will go into detail in terms of how, deriving this, but it's, it's an average value. What you're freely calculating by this formula is on average, when f is a nice continuous function, what is the average y-coordinate over the interval between a and b? So, applying this formula to our problem here, the average value of the function f of x is 15 over x over the interval from 1 to 12. A is equal to 1, B is equal to 12, so here we go. This will be 1 over B, 12, minus A, 1, times integral from 1 to 12, A to B, of the function 15 over X dx. All I'm doing is plugging the information into my formula. Well, before we integrate it, let's clean it up. Uh, 12 minus 1 is 11, so this is 1 over 11 times integral from 1 to 12 of 15 over x dx. Well, this problem, you clean it up. You can pull your constant out front. This is 15 over 11 times integral from 1 to 12 of 1 over x dx. Now, this is an integral that we all have memorized by this point. The integral of 1 over x dx is the natural log absolute value of x. So this would be equal to 15 over 11 times natural log of the absolute value of x evaluated from, using that second fundamental theorem of calculus, from 1 to 12. And according to that second fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, when, after we integrate, we have bounds. We plug in top bound minus bottom bound because it's a definite integral. So this is 15 over 11 times the natural log of 12 minus 15 over 11 times the natural log of 1. But if I wanted to clean this up a little bit here, what exactly is the natural log of 1? Go back to your log properties, but the natural log of 1 was equal to 0. So your final solution is 15 over 11 natural log of 12. And for those people that just uh, want to know what, understand what this means, is that if you look at the function, 15 over x, between 1 and 12, x is 1 to x is 12. On average, this is the uh, coordinate that you get, which I'll go ahead and put on the calculator, give you a decimal version of this. This is parentheses 15 divided by 11 times the uh, natural log of 12. 3.388509068. On average, that's what's going on. Uh, in terms of this 15 over x function between 1 and 12. Well, I hope this has been helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.